it's a real pleasure uh, for me to uh, give the final talk of this session. And um, I know some of you are worried that I might be singing. Um, <laughs> but I would never want to follow David, and it would be unethical for me to sing. So I won't do that. Um, uh, when Mark asked me a number of months ago to give him a title for this talk, I said, sure, surgical informed consent. I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, but in fact, uh, I'm going to talk about surgery on the cancer previver and changing the dynamic of surgical uh, consent. And um, uh, I'll try to, th this is uh, some thoughts that um, I had, don't have a lot of data on, but I have a lot of thoughts about it, and so I, I'm interested in other people's uh, perceptions. Um, I have a disclosure, but it's irrelevant to this presentation. So uh, by way of outline, I want to talk a little bit about what the cancer previvor is and what prophylactic surgery is. I want to talk about informed consent for surgery, uh, and then how we might need to change the way we talk about informed consent for prophylactic surgery compared to regular old operations. Um, so uh, what's the goal for cancer surgery? If you think about it, um, it is to remove the cancer. And so in contrast to uh, people like Giuliano Testa, who does transplants, or, or Gretchen, who does vascular surgery, they fix things. I don't ever fix anything. I only take it out. I have a very limited repertoire. Um, and so my kids no longer ask me about medical issues. Um, so, so, when we, so when we have a cancer patient, and they, uh, the goal for surgery is to remove the cancer, hopefully cure the patient, do it with the lowest risk. Um, and so let me ask you to consider a case. So a 30-year-old woman who's diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer, she consults with me. Um, I recommend surgery. In this case, she needs a total thyroidectomy. The risks are low. The benefits are high. We can talk about that. It's unlikely it's going to affect her long-term outcome uh, in terms of quality of life. And the patient wants the cancer out. And that's what I can offer her. Um, and so we plan surgery. And um, that's generally sort of how it goes uh, when patients need surgery. And even if there's a complication, most patients say, but you were treating cancer. And in fact, if a patient has a potentially high risk operation, but it's to remove a cancer, many patients are willing to accept that because it is so good to get the cancer out, or at least that's the perception. So, we heard a little bit of yesterday from Jonathan Marin a great talk about uh, precision medicine and genetic testing. And I want to just ask us to look at that in a slightly different way. So the goal, I would say, of precision medicine and genetic testing is to predict, in many ways, who will get cancer and treat them before they ever get that cancer. And so those people who have a genetic predisposition for cancer are known as cancer previvors. Um, and so the question then is, is prophylactic surgery on cancer previvors any different from other operations? Now, what's a cancer previvor? Well, this is someone who has a predisposition to cancer but has not had the disease. And so it derived from uh, initially BRCA1 carriers who were at high risk for breast cancer. And the thought was you couldn't really call them cancer survivors if they never had cancer. Um, and for those who have had cancer, it was somewhat offending to consider this group of people who never got had cancer as part of that group. And so it was a, a, an effort to create a different label, um, and that's where previvors came from. So um, in the BRCA1 group, many of these patients had prophylactic mastectomies, so they might never get breast cancer. And in fact, um, over recent years, we've had increasingly numbers of hereditary cancer syndromes. We know about BRCA. 
HPA and breast cancer, Lynch syndrome, um, Cowden syndrome, I won't go into all of these, Lee Fraumeni syndrome, um, CDH1 mutations that increase the risk for breast cancer, uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. Now that's one that I really want to spend a lot of time talking about because as an endocrine surgeon, you know, that's what it's all about, preventing medullary thyroid cancer. I would argue that this is just the tip of the iceberg and that in future years there will be even more syndromes defined such that we can identify who will have a high likelihood of getting a cancer in the future. So the ultimate treatment for the cancer previvor is prophylactic surgery and that is to remove the potentially diseased organ before the patient ever gets cancer. So in MEN, multiple endocrine neoplasia, types 2A and 2B carriers. So these are people who can be identified based on genetic testing. And these patients, if they have the gene mutation, they have a virtually 100% chance of developing medullary thyroid cancer in their lifetime. And so this is a group of patients where if we make a diagnosis early and we take out their thyroid, they won't ever get medullary thyroid cancer. And so prophylactic total thyroidectomy prior to the development of medullary thyroid cancer means that patients are cured of a disease that they will never get. So that's really the holy grail of all of precision medicine as far as I can tell. So to prevent a, a cancer by removing an organ that will ultimately likely get cancer. And frequently, these patients are operated on in childhood. And depending on the mutation, sometimes in the first year of life even. So um, there are, I believe, ethical issues in surgery on the previvor. And so all surgery, on previvors is by definition prophylactic. So it is to prevent the development of cancer. It is not therapeutic. So they don't yet have cancer. So we're not treating a cancer, but we're trying to prevent the development of a cancer. So the question that I believe is important for us to address is are there differences in operating on a patient with cancer when compared to operating on a patient who has a risk of cancer? And I would ask that you spend a couple minutes with me thinking about informed consent for prophylactic surgery. So we all know about surgical informed consent. We've heard some great talks about it, much more thoughtful than mine. Um, we know that patients, in order to give informed consent, have to have the capacity to make a decision. They need to understand something about the risks of the operation, the benefits of the operation. If there are alternatives, they need to hear about the alternatives to the proposed surgery. Um, and I would argue that most surgeons that I talk to in the US really focus on risks when they're obtaining informed consent. And um, even, you know, it's true that we have to explain why the surgery is recommended, and I think as Gretchen pointed out, the indication for surgery, sort of what is going to be the benefit for surgery for the patient is important, um, but risks are thought by many surgeons to be the patient's primary concern. And that's what I see most preoperative information brochures, that's what it really focuses on, is the, are the risks of surgery. And I think many surgeons believe that by focusing on these risks, we will actually reduce the likelihood for malpractice lawsuits if a complication occurs. Now, whether that's true or not remains to be seen, but I, that's not what I'm going to talk about. But let me ask, is there a difference when performing prophylactic surgery versus cancer surgery? So from the surgeon's point of view, I would suggest to you that it feels like a very different situation. And I do believe that in prophylactic surgery, there has to be a much greater emphasis on the benefits of the operation rather than just focusing on the risks of the surgery. Um, and it's really that risk-benefit ratio that becomes most important. So I want you to consider two cases. So case one, five-year-old girl, 
she has medullary thyroid cancer. She's been diagnosed with it. She has a total thyroidectomy and a central node dissection. Trust me, it's appropriate surgery for this disease. And she suffers a permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injury causing permanent hoarseness. So this is an unfortunate complication. We know that this happens in thyroid surgery somewhere in the range of one to three percent of the time. Most surgeons say one percent. Um, many databases suggest it's a little higher. Um, but nevertheless, it's not a common thing, but it can happen even in the best hands. Consider a second case. S Five-year-old girl has MEN2A. She has a genetic predisposition to medullary thyroid cancer. She has a prophylactic total thyroidectomy, and she suffers a permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injury causing permanent hoarseness. So think about the differences between these two cases. So no one, especially a surgeon, wants a complication. But I would argue that it's much easier for both surgeons and patients and their families to accept a complication when it occurs in the course of treating a cancer than in the course of treating what might become a cancer someday in the future. And with the second case, I would argue that many parents will always secretly wonder, will our daughter ever have really gotten cancer? We know what the genetic test shows. We know what the statistics say. But with probabilities, it's not exactly 100% of people that will get medullary thyroid cancer. And so, Again, I think that we need to start thinking about how to conceptualize informed consent in this patient population differently because in the future, I think surgeons are going to be doing many, many more of these operations. So although the risks of surgery in these two groups may be completely unchanged, so prophylactic surgery, the risks of the thyroidectomy were the same as for the therapeutic thyroidectomy, but the benefits are different if it is not to treat a known cancer. So the question then is, do the benefits of avoiding cancer outweigh the risks? And there, in that situation, it really depends on how high is the chance of getting cancer. And so it really shifts the focus of the conversation, I think, a little bit away from the actual risks of the cancer. And so graphically, because, you know, you, it's nice to have a graphic representation. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a particularly good one or not. But if you see, when, we're, when it comes to cancer surgery, I don't know if this, uh, I don't really have something that points. But anyway, on the, on the left-hand side here, for cancer surgery, if you look at benefits in blue and risks uh, uh, in uh, the risk of getting uh, an operation in red, there's a large difference. Um, if you look at the risk of cancer, well, there's a tremendous, if you already know you have cancer, then that's clear. If you look at a previvor surgery in the middle, if the risk of getting cancer is low, then the benefit is relatively low. So even if the risks are exactly the same in those last two columns, it's going to be much more likely that a patient is going to want the operation that's prophylactic when the risk of cancer is very high. So, so I think that we are going to have to shift our conversation to make this work. So I do think that there are a lot of future issues that we're going to have to address. Um, are the complications of cancer previvors more difficult to live with than the complications from treatment of cancer? From a patient's perspective, if you have the same disability, is it more problematic if you know that you didn't actually have cancer? Um, are stresses on parents who choose surgery for their children who are cancer previvors significantly different from stresses on parents of thyroid cancer survivors? Are there levels of cancer risk below which surgeons will be unwilling to offer prophylactic surgery because the benefits are too low? And should it be the patient or the surgeon who decides what that benefit difference is that's uh, great enough to warrant 
having the rest of the surgery. So um, these are, um, again, more questions than answers, which I think is okay in an ethics uh, talk. Um, I do think that genetic testing for cancers will increase the number of cancers, uh, cancer previvors in the years to come. I do think that there are a lot of unanswered questions that remain regarding the long-term outcomes of cancer previvors, because this is a patient group that has really not been well identified or studied. Uh, and I do think that as the genetic causes of cancer increase in the years to come, there will be more and more patients who have this potential for prophylactic surgery. And I do think that surgeons may need to change their approach to informed consent and focus much more on what the benefits are relative to the risks. Um, so with that, um, I, uh, I'm very happy to have had the chance to share these thoughts, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. So I agree with everything you said. Um, I think the genetics doctors, from my own experience, are suggesting some pre surgeries. And I'm not to do what I want to do. And so I think all of these issues are real. And I will tell you my team is split. <laughs> Going to be a problem. Yeah. And so it's something that if we can think of, because if you've got one doctor saying you need to, you need to do it today, you've got another doctor saying, well, you need to do it next month, you've got another doctor saying, well, I don't care. It's complicated. Yes, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a little. It's a little bit hard to fault a surgeon for not wanting to take out an organ that is healthy based on a statistical probability that it may become diseased in the future. So, uh, but it, yeah. Yeah, hi, Neil. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. I enjoyed that. And um, as I mentioned, I, I do uh, breast cancer surgery, so the previvor thing is, is definitely with you. And I think maybe if you had a third category when you gave your five year old. Uh, young girls with cancer or risk of cancer. Because so much of this, um, from my experience, has to do with feelings and, and how do you feel and how do your patients feel and how do they feel about these risks. And if you have another group there where you say, this five-year-old girl had a sister who died because they didn't get that test. And now she has that test. They're much more feeling like, I need to do this, and this is much more serious, and my benefit is much greater. So the closer the family member, and the more family members who have died or had serious complications from chemotherapy or the actual cancer, the more likely they are to see the benefit of saying, I will take more risk, and the benefit is large to me because it's very personal. No, excellent point, and, and you know, I think that uh, Part of, the, part of the challenge is, I mean, I think in, in medullary thyroid cancer, when there's a virtually 100% chance of getting cancer, I feel like it is in some ways my role to try to convince the family that it is the right thing to have an operation. But I do think that there are situations where the risk of cancer is not that high, and deciding exactly whether my role should be one of uh, encouraging strongly to have surgery or whether my role should be more one of sort of educator and you know leave it to the to the family uh, to make a decision but yeah thanks for your comments <coughs> Darren yeah just thinking out loud a little bit here but I think there could be a lot of parallels drawn between this idea and the world of living donor transplantation um, it's another group of patients who are well at the time of surgery in a lot of ways and are you know, making a donation for a loved one or a, a friend or something like that. So I just, I, I wonder um, if there are similarities in, in the consent process. And I haven't been part of the consent process for living donor transplantation, but it'd be an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, no, thank you, excellent point. All right, thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks.